It's cool. It was very cool. So be encouraged this morning. All right. Let's get into it. We're beginning a new sermon series today, and I'm excited for it. As much as, you know, we've been enjoying the Old Testament, First and Second Samuel, First Kings, I know, you know, a lot of you wanted to stay in First Kings, you're really, you know, into it, I was into it too, but it's time for a change of pace. And what better than opening up to the Gospels? And what better than the very first book of the New Testament to be a perfect tie-in with the Old Testament? Because as soon as you open the first page of the New Testament, you see and you discover that this is rooted in something much, much older. There is a broad and deep root connecting to a stump that's laid dormant for over 400 years. As the last prophet of the Old Testament, uh, we read you know, in, in the Minor Prophets, the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi, one of the Minor Prophets. And then there's 400 years of silence. It's a painful silence, as the people have learned through this time to hang on every word of God. The synagogue system is developed during this time, uh, so the scriptures are now being read aloud in every major city around the world, as many of the diaspora, which is the Jewish scattered peoples, uh, from being conquered. They, they've been dispersed far and wide into every major city, and the peoples around the world are looking for the Messiah. There was a hopeful expectation during this time, um, as there was in no other, uh, for the times have been fulfilled. The appointed time of the Messiah was at hand. The wise were reading the signs and were understanding what was happening. The wise men from afar, we know, begin their journey from the east to the promised land. Whispers began as the people lived under this oppressive rule of the mighty Roman Empire, where the emperors had just recently begun declaring themselves to be God. Caesar Augustus was declared by the Senate a God in 44 BC. Uh, so, so the world was growing smaller as the Roman roads were growing broader and expanding further and further. And at this time, zealots of the Jews, uh, nationalists were storing up their weapons for rebellion against the empire, waiting for their warrior king to appear. And some, like the Sadducees, the religious sect, they learned to take advantage of the Roman Empire, of the situation, uh, being only as religious as need be in order to control the temple sacrificial system. And they grew comfortable and arrogant and wealthy um, off the backs of the people. And the Pharisees, another, another religious sect we'll see, were puffed up in pride as they looked down on everyone, especially the Gentiles, especially the, the Romans. Um, they looked down even on the Sadducees. Um, and they looked down on the common people. And many wanted nothing more than notoriety. They, they just were consumed with becoming prestigious among their colleagues, uh, keeping everybody downtrodden with their endless rules, piling a heavy burden, adding to the law of God. So this is a time, as we open up the New Testament, this is a time of political and religious upheaval, a time of divisions, a time of civil war. It was being murmured about and rumored about. Militias were readying themselves for a fight. A perfect storm was forming amongst all the powers, the powers of the air, the powers of the nations, the powers of this present darkness, because everyone was watching. Everyone was aware that the time was near. All the signs were pointing to the promised one of old was coming. He was coming soon. The Messiah who would bring peace, who would establish his kingdom, who would rule and reign was at hand. However, this all happened in a way that nearly no one thought, much less expected. Through a family of humble origin, Yet, they had the blood of kings running through their veins, and not just any kings, the very specific king, King David, the king whom the Messiah was promised to come through, whom we spent the last year, more than a year, studying his origins and his rule and his reign, and his son Solomon, who built the first temple in Jerusalem, the king that that whose line remained unbroken, yet 
it was shattered and, and scattered as the people never again experienced the strength and the security and, and, and the peace that they had under David's rule and under the rule of Solomon. In the intervening, inter, intervening period between then and as we open up the New Testament, the Assyrian Empire had conquered the northern tribes. And then 150 years after the northern tribes were conquered by the Assyrians, then comes the Babylonian Empire. And they conquered the southern tribes. But the southern tribes repented. They repented. They turned back to God. And 70 years later, they were allowed to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the city. And then, a few hundred years after that, in rolls Alexander the Great. And he comes and he goes through all the Mediterranean, Hellenizing the, the entire Mediterranean area. So now everybody speaks Greek. And it's called Koine Greek or Common Greek. And that's the language that the New Testament is written in. It's also the language that the oldest uh, full copy of the Old Testament is written in, in Koine Greek, the Septuagint. There are order, there, there's some older Hebrew texts like the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they're not a complete compilation like the Septuagint. And so Alexander the Great changed the, the landscape. Everybody spoke a common language. Everybody had a common language in the Roman Empire. And Alexander the Great's empire was, after his death, it was split up uh, between his generals. And there was a very wicked general that arose to power, Antiochus Epiphanes. And Epiphanes in Greek means God manifest. So he's a blasphemer, and he was called Antiochus Epiphanes by himself. But, but people around him called him Antiochus Epimenes as a mocking name, meaning, meaning in Greek, the mad. So he ruled over Israel. He got that section of Alexander's kingdom, um, and he defiled the temple. He sacrificed pigs on the altar of, de of the temple, declaring him himself God at the temple. So he was an antichrist. He was a type and a shadow of the antichrists to come. And this type and shadow we see, uh, they, they blaspheme God, they hate, and they kill Jews. And we're told in Scripture that there will be many antichrists in our days, and we've seen that. Uh, and we know that there will be a final antichrist who will rise to unprecedented power, um, and it will be in the type and the shadow of Antiochus Epiphanes. And after him, we see uh, the Roman Emperor Nero, who does the same thing. And then after him, we see Adolf Hitler, who does the same thing. And, and then there's going to be more and more and more, as Jesus tells us, and then there's going to be final one. And he'll have unprecedented power, never seen before, and then Jesus will come and lay him low and establish his kingdom. <clears throat> okay, there's a, there's a lot. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's, real quick, let's, to get a better grasp of this historical timeline, um, let's pull up, we've got a couple charts here, timelines, to help us wrap our head around it. Sorry about the missions banners. Um, you can see better over here. Um, okay, this one shows the epochs um, of the covenants and the temples. And so uh, we see here uh, the kingdoms, epoch one, um, creation of the 2000 BC, epoch two, we see the Abrahamic covenant, the Jews are in the Holy Land, um, and then they go, you know, slaves in Egypt, they come back to the Holy Land uh, with the Mosaic covenant, and then we have the Davidic covenant, which we studied. Um, in 2 Samuel 7, um, and then they come, and then they begin, they, the kingdom splits up in the Holy Land, uh, the Assyrian Empire comes, takes them, and then the Babylonian Empire comes and conquers them, and takes them into exile. Um, and so you kind of see this timeline moving along, and they have the, the rebuilt temples, the rebuilt temple, and it moves on to Herod's temple here is built, um, and then uh, the new uh, covenant happens here while the Roman Empire is ruling uh, the time. So Maybe that's a little too small for some of you. Hopefully you can see that. Let's go to one more uh, just to get a, a better idea of the, of the epochs. Okay, I'll just, just, let me just tell you. Okay, it shows, <laughs> it shows the, uh, the books of the Bible that are uh, um, cataloging the epochs. So epoch one and two, they've got Genesis all the way through it. Um, the third, you know, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, this is what's happening during these seasons. Epoch four, you know, Judges, Ruth, the Samuels. Um, and then it goes on to uh, the prophets that are coming here in Epoch five. And then Epoch six, uh, we get a lot of the minor prophets that are happening here, like Zechariah, and we talked about Malachi. And then Epoch seven, there's nothing. There's nothing. 
Uh, so those 400 years of silence, and then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then Acts, the Romans, Corinthians, all these, and all the New Testament comes, boom, all at once um, at the time of Christ. And so that's, I mean, that kind of gives you a trajectory of, of what's happened in the intervening period between David and now the coming of the Christ, the promised one. And the people, the Jewish people, um, are called Jews now because the southern kingdom of Judah is, is what's left. Uh, the Jewish people are now chastened by God um, through their exile, uh, through their being conquered um, because of their unfaithfulness. And they're taking God's word very seriously now. They didn't in the past, right? They, I mean, they, they, they strayed again and again and again. Um, but now they're taking God's word very seriously um, and sometimes getting it wrong, as we often do, but at least they're taking it seriously. And now the long-awaited Messiah is at the door. The time is ripe. It's the Kairos time, the perfect timing of God. And Matthew, formerly known as Levi, the tax collector, now known as Matthew, one of the 12, one of the 12 apostles, disciples of Christ, is writing his detailed account of the life and teaching of Jesus as teacher, as Lord, and as our Savior. It is said that when Matthew got up, uh, when Jesus called him, come follow me, it said that when Matthew got up, he left everything except he took a pen and parchment with him because Matthew has such a detailed account of the teachings of Jesus. He, he includes more uh, detail and depth of the teachings of Jesus than any of the other gospel accounts, which is why it is one of my favorite books in all of scripture because when you open up Matthew, you see a lot of red if you've got a red letter Bible. Uh, you see a lot, a lot of red with the words of Jesus in, in, in red, um, and, and it's, it's really, really uh, cool to study it and to see how Matthew uh, took extensive notes on what Jesus was teaching, and it's a blessing for us to have today. So if you've got your Bibles, um, I encourage you to open up to Matthew chapter 1, the first book of the New Testament, and we'll see it begins with a genealogy, so it is rooting itself squarely as a continuation of the scriptures. Uh, the scriptures, what we would call the Old Testament. Uh, Matthew understands that what he is writing is divine revelation uh, from God. Uh, the holy scriptures inspired and directed by the spirit of God. He's being carried along by the spirit of God. And um, he begins his text with 42 generations. These, he, he includes three groups of 14. So 14 generations he has from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the deportation to Babylon, and 14 generations from that time to Christ. And in lieu of reading it all, uh, I found a much better alternative for us this morning. Um, it's a song um, that sings the genealogy of Jesus, and I think you'll enjoy it much more than hearing me read it. And if you're online, I don't know if we got the, the, uh, the copyright um, go ahead for online. So online audience, look up, Google, pause me, Google poor Bishop Hooper, that's the artist, and the song is called Christ. So Google that, you're going to want to listen to it. Uh, but first, we're going to read verse 1 of Matthew chapter 1. He writes the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So throughout this account, Matthew presents Jesus as the kingly Messiah, promised from David's royal line. Remember 2 Samuel chapter 7 and how the Old Testament prophesied that the Messiah would be the son of David. In the very first sentence, Matthew points to Jesus as the fulfillment of of Old Testament prophecy. So let's listen to the singing of the lineage of the Messiah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon, to the Christ, 14 generations. 14, 14, 14. We might not catch this, but in saying this, Matthew is making it known that this 
genealogy is, it's edited. It's not exhaustive. This was revealing to us something while making it also easy for us to remember and to memorize and even to sing. Three groups of 14. It's also six groups of seven. Then at the end of the six sevens, uh, begins the seventh seven, the time of the Messiah begins. Uh, and we'll get more into biblical prophecy next week. Uh, but Matthew is organizing the genealogy to show the beginning of the Messianic age. But to do this, these 14, 14, 14s, uh, he skips a few names here and there. Uh, like in verse 8, Matthew records that Joram begot Uzziah. Uh, Uzziah was not the immediate son of Joram. There were three kings between them. Uh, Ahazai, Joash, and Amazai. So this was a common practice in the genealogies to uh, shorten them uh, where everybody understood that, okay, he's not his like, direct son, he's his great-grandson or great-great-grandson. Uh, everybody knows that, so it's fine. Um, it's like saying, I'm the son of Abraham, uh, as Matthew does with Jesus in the very beginning. The most condensed version uh, is Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Right? That's as condensed as it got. Um, another area where Matthew condenses is as verse 11 between Josiah and Jeconiah. And the wicked king he skips is Jehoiakim. So this guy is that he skips. He's so wicked that God promised that he would have no one to sit on the throne of David. He promised this uh, through the prophet Jeremiah. And so this is, this is uh, presented as a significant problem. Uh, because if someone was a blood descendant of David through Jehoiakim, he could not sit on the throne of Israel and be king and be the Messiah because of this curse uh, recorded in Jeremiah chapter 36. However, uh, direct descent from David was still a necessity for the Messiah. And here's where these genealogies get really interesting, because Matthew is giving us the genealogy through Joseph. And this is typical. The genealogies fathered the line uh, follow the line of the father. Uh, so Jesus is legally a son of David through his adopted father, Joseph. Um, so he's of the royal line, and yet he's not a biological son of Jehoiakim. So the curse does not have sway on him. And then more interesting still is we, we get a whole different genealogy from Luke's gospel account. Uh, they're the same, leading to David, of course, uh, but that is where they split up dramatically. Why? Uh, because Luke is giving the genealogy of someone else. Matthew's account was written, and Matthew tracked the experiences of Joseph and his gene genealogy, as we'll see. Uh, but Luke, uh, many of you know, if you're familiar with the Gospel account of Luke, he zeroes in on Mary and her experiences. And Luke, by all indications, without expressly saying it, but, but to you know, give all the implications that he is giving to us in his genealogy, uh, Mary's genealogy through her side. Um, Luke even says, before giving the genealogy, that Jesus being the son, as was supposed of Joseph, um, and then he gives a different genealogy than Matthew, stemming not from Solomon and Jehoiakim, but from another son of David, a man named Nathan. And this genealogy, many, including me, believe is the genealogy of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who did share her bloodline with him. So by the blood and also by legal standing, Jesus is a son of David. But the bloodline was not that of Jehoiakim. So the curse on Jehoiakim again, had no legal grounds on Jesus to be the Messiah. So God's pretty sneaky. I don't know if you know that. He's pretty sneaky. Why? Because there is an adversary. The devil, our ancient enemy, is seeking to uh, undo the plans of God every step of the way. And at every turn, when all hope seems lost... God turns and does something like this, and Scripture, as always, continues to reveal to us the manifold wisdom of God, and that his enemies, in their attempt to undo the things of God, to undermine the plans and the promises of God, find themselves again and again completely bamboozled. Psalm 37 verse 13 says this, but the Lord laughs at the wicked for he knows their day is coming.
He's not worried. Neither should we be. And keep in mind as we look at this genealogy uh, that Jewish, the Jewish people kept and they keep extensive genealogies. And this is very important to them because they saw that it was important to God in these prophecies. And, and know that if the Jewish uh, opponents of Jesus, which there were many um, amongst the Sadducees and the Pharisees, if they could have demonstrated that Jesus was not descended from David, they would have. They would have. They would have sought any means possible to disqualify his claim to be Messiah. Yet they did not because they could not. And today we should remember Paul's writings uh, when he warns the early church about uh, spending too much time debating about endless you know, genealogies. He kind of gives them, them a rebuke. He's like, don't get into arguments about this. He he's, says in 1 Timothy 1 and chapter 6, and um, Titus chapter 3, um, he saw that the Jewish interest in genealogies could sometimes uh, be a dangerous distraction from their true mission. So Paul, he warns these younger pastors like uh, Timothy, he warns Titus to guard against those who are fascinated with these endless genealogies. They're like, oh, look at this, look at this. It's like, no, stay focused on the mission that Christ has given us. Uh, but a few things to note in this genealogy we could take a look at are the women that Matthew mentions, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and of course the unnamed wife of Uriah, whom we recently studied, Bathsheba. Women were rarely mentioned in ancient genealogies, and the four mentioned here are worthy of note because they each are examples to us of God's grace. Rahab, from a pagan prostitute to being adopted into the family of God. Why? Because she feared God and she put her trust in him. She put her trust in the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. Same with Tamar, same with Ruth. All these being Gentiles and then becoming a part of the family of God and then the unnamed wife of Uriah the Hittite who was an adulteress with David and yet God chose her to bring forth Solomon the son whom would build the temple of God. So these four women have an important place in the genealogy of Jesus to demonstrate to us that Jesus is entering in as a representative of everybody. Warts, scars, wounds, and all. He is near to the broken hearted. He's near to the lowly, to the fallen. He will show his love even to the poorest, even to the most obscure In the Old Testament, we see uh, the faithful and wise women like Ruth, like Abigail and Rahab and Esther, who took initiative, who trusted in God. And this faith, we see it blooms into Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene and Martha and Joanna and many more, which show up in prominence. Um, Even more so, we see more show up in the book of Acts, playing an important role in the early church. And we see, we see how the scripture reveals this to us. And we can look at our, at our modern equal rights today and see how it's been shaped by that Judeo-Christian ethic. Obviously, this is not, this is not the case around the world. This, this is not the case for every ideology, for every philosophy, or every religion in the world. But it certainly is the case when Christianity is practiced and followed in its best and purest form. Suddenly, there's no difference. Suddenly, there's no longer Jew nor Greek. Slave nor free, male nor female. Those differences that once divide us no longer do in Christ. We are united. We know that we are all made in the image of God. And as believers, we know we are equal inheritors of the kingdom of God. There's no preference. There's no favoritism. God has no respecter of persons, no positions, no titles. There, there's, we're equal inheritors. So at its best, we see that Christianity transforms all human relationships. And it doesn't always get practiced at its best. We know that, and we've seen that, and it's sad. But the nature of God's word, when his people begin to read it seriously and as authoritative, it is able to correct us. It's able to train us up in righteousness so we learn and we grow in our faith and in our love. And we're given many examples of this in Scripture. These women in the genealogy of Jesus are just being a few who encountered God in a real way and were changed 
because of it. Verse 18 goes on. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So Matthew doesn't really tell us about the birth of Jesus. Luke, Luke does that. Matthew instead tells us uh, where Jesus came from, and it tells the story through the eyes of Joseph. So we hear she was betrothed to Joseph, and that Joseph uh, then sought to divorce her quietly. But how does that work if they're not married? Uh, well, there is essentially three steps uh, to uh, marriage in the Jewish world of Jesus' time. Uh, first, there was the engagement, and that can happen when you're very young. Uh, it would likely be like an arranged type marriage. There was an engagement. Um, and then uh, the betrothal took place, and the couple were known as, as husband and wife, um, and a betrothal could only be broken by divorce. And betrothal typically lasted a year, and then after that year, uh, there was finally the official marriage took place. So um, before their period of betrothal is over, Mary is pregnant, and Joseph knows it's not his. But he didn't want to make a spectacle about it. He, he didn't want to shame Mary. He, he simply thought he'll do it quietly. But God had something to tell him. After his character was proven, God reveals to Joseph the incredible thing that has taken place. Mary is still a virgin. She has conceived by the miraculous power of God. And verse 20 of Matthew chapter 1 goes on, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is so cool because the name of Jesus means salvation. It means, or it can also mean God is salvation. That's the name he's told to give him. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. End chapter. When it says he did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son, it means he did not have normal marital relations with her until after Jesus was born. She remained a virgin all the way until giving birth to our Lord. And then the implication of the word until being that after his birth, Mary and Joseph had a normal marriage. And at some point began normal marital relations. Uh, theologians who wish to maintain Mary's lifelong virginity face the massive problem of the Pauline epistles, the four gospels, and the book of Acts that all mention the brothers of Jesus, the half-brothers of Jesus, with Mark and Matthew recording their names and Matthew adding uh, to Jesus the unnamed sisters of Jesus to the list. Um, it's only in extra-biblical writings that, uh, that her perpetual virginity is put forth. Uh, but it's been debated and talked about since at least the third century. So all, all I'll say about that is that you don't, you don't read the Bible and come away thinking that Mary is a perpetual virgin. Uh, in fact, it seems clearly to imply that she probably was not. And there's no need for her to be. There's, there's no need for that. The only important thing is exactly what Matthew emphasizes. She was a virgin until the birth of Jesus. And then she had a normal marriage. Why did she have a normal marriage? Because verse 24 and 25, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. So why did they have a normal marriage? Because of Joseph's obedience to the calling of God. And this leads us to our first takeaway from this chapter, which is, obedience to the will of God. Joseph's obedience is notable to us. He instantly under, understood the truth of it when he was told from the angel. He understood the importance of his obedience, and he obeyed. 
And with his obedience, he faced the whispers, he faced the rumors being shared about his unfaithful wife, but he endured it, and he stayed true to Mary. Why? Because Joseph trusted in the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. And speaking of the Lord's half-brothers, James, the brother of Jesus, writes in James chapter 4, verse 13 through 17, um, he's writing regarding obedience. He says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So we are to say, the Lord wills it. We will live and do this or that. We say this with an understanding that this life, as James says, is a mist. It's a vapor. And it's here and then it's gone. But there is one who holds all things in his hands. There is one who has a plan, knows the future. He has an eternal plan. So we trust in him with a readiness and a willingness to obey. Why would we not? He gives us each breath that we take, each beat of our heart and our chest is from him. And when we know what we ought to do, when we know the will of God, when it's been made known, when it's been made clear to us, and we fail to do it, then as James says, that to us is sin. It's disobedience. So may we take the path of Joseph. Even when it seems strange and scary and, and, and why, why would I do this? It doesn't make sense to me or to the ways of the world. We still say, yes, Lord. I don't fully understand what you're doing, what you're calling me to do, but I will walk in obedience to where you've called and where you've shown me to go. And when we do that, even when we feel we are in entirely over our heads, we can walk in confidence because we know we're walking according to the will of the Father. We're in his will. And because of that, we can walk in confidence. And when God calls, he equips. He equips us. He equipped Mary and Joseph for the great task of raising his only begotten son, our Lord. It's intimidating. He equipped them to do so. He will equip you for what he's called you to do, no matter the task. And we see from this that Mary and Joseph, they were indeed a very special couple. No doubt about that. We see Joseph's character revealed here, and Luke reveals to us the great uh, righteousness, the great character of Mary. But they weren't special by things that the world would call special. They weren't influencers. They weren't holding prestigious positions. They weren't movers and shakers in their communities. No, none of those. But what they both were was faithful. This is what God is calling of us to trust in him, to walk in that kind of quiet, faithful obedience. God, I'm, I'm gonna go where you tell me to go. I'm gonna say what you tell me to say. I'm gonna do what you tell me to do. That's what he's calling of us. And as we do that, we know we are in the will of God. We can walk in confidence. And we can know that perhaps uh, we might hear from an angel of the Lord uh, in those times as Joseph had a dream from the angel of God. And the author of Hebrews tells us, you know, who knows when you might be entertaining angels, so be ready, be ready uh, to show hospitality uh, in all times, in all seasons. So as we walk in that obedience, uh, we walk knowing that God is at work in our lives. <clears throat> all right, the second takeaway and the final takeaway is this. It's like the first one, but it's a little different. We are faithful because he is faithful. This entire chapter that we read is a testament to the faithfulness of God, who declared with his mouth and he fulfilled with his hands. He promised and he delivered again and again and again. He never fails to keep his word. Remember last chapter, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, 
Uh, and Solomon is praying to God. They finish the, the construction of the temple, and he, they're commissioning the temple. And Solomon is on his knees praying before God um, at this commissioning. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 23 to 24, Solomon says, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. You have kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand have fulfilled it this day. Second Samuel chapter 7, God promised to establish the throne of David forever. Isaiah chapter 7, God promised, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 to 6 promised, surely he has borne our griefs. And carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The angel of the Lord said to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And as Matthew says in verse 22 of Matthew chapter 1, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Promises that were made 700 years before this, 1,000 years before this, are being fulfilled. And because of that, we can trust in our Lord all the more and seek to walk in faithful obedience to our faithful heavenly father who has declared with his mouth and by his hand he has fulfilled it for on the cross jesus declared it is finished it's finished and he put sin to death and at the resurrection he conquered death itself And he's received the keys of death and Hades and all authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth has been given to him. And at his name, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. Amen. That is the faithfulness of God who was promised with his mouth and delivered with his hand. And Matthew chapter 1 is a great testimony to just that. We can trust in God this morning. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you how you've revealed yourself to us through your word. That you've shown us again and again and again just how faithful you are, Lord. Help us to be those who are faithful as well. Help us to be those who are ready for when you call, we will answer with yes. Yes, we will go. Yes, we will trust you. We don't know what what that's going to look like, but we know we want to be in your will because where else would we be but a mist and a vapor here and then gone? What would our plans come to apart from you? Nothing, Lord. So all we have, all our hope is in you. We find our strength and our resolve and our confidence in you and in your word and through your Son, our Lord Jesus. So thank you, Father. Thank you for how you've called us to yourself, how you've made a way where there was no way before. Thank you for your love for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing. We were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word The throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt
are suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. 